we have we have seen abundant evidence uh, of uh, of this truth that is commonly not appreciated by either Christians or not Christians. Some people have gone through their entire lives without paying any attention to this at all. And on our way to a greater understanding of the heart is the realization that truth enters from the outside of one's mind. Maybe you've never thought about that before, but think about it. Truth has to come in from outside and this makes sense in view of the fact that the outside of the sinner, Spirit of God, is the provider of faith. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, where Paul identifies the third person of the Trinity as the Spirit of faith, it makes additional sense in view of the fact that the outside of the sinner, Word of God, this is not inside you, this is outside you, the outside of the sinner word of God is the means used to impart faith, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Thus, when dealing with matters of the mind and heart in the realm of the spiritual domain, Christians are rightly suspicious of any supposed truth that is said to well up from within. To well up from within... Anything coming from within any individual is outside the realm of the objective and verifiable. Um, it is truth that is therefore not to be trusted as being real truth. If it comes from inside you, uh, you ought to be really, really suspicious. Truth comes from the outside of the individual. And therefore, there is no such thing as your truth. There is no such thing as my truth. There is only the truth. The only source of truth that is given by revelation that is objective and unchangeable is the Word of God, the Bible. Once there is substantial agreement among individuals about Bible doctrine and the will of God, it becomes possible for those individuals to then be of one mind, to be of one accord, and to fulfill requirements that are expressed by this Greek word that we've become familiar with over the years, found so frequently in the book of Acts, homothumadon, which talks about being of one mind, of one accord. Once truth has entered the mind by means of the eyes and by means of the ears, um, it is possible for an individual to then implant truth into the heart. Indeed, when the truth under consideration is God's word, it is the individual's responsibility to hide God's word in his heart that he might not sin against God. Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Just as it is possible for a group of people to be of one mind, to be of one accord, so it is possible for a group of people to be of one heart. And this is significant when you're reminded that the heart is the seat of the will and, and the faculty wherein decisions are made. What is of crucial, or what is of crucial importance, is not necessarily that people agree with their minds about some things or, or agree in their hearts about some things. What is without question of great importance is that what they are in agreement about is true. So a group of people can be agreed in their mind about something, but what they're agreed about is wrong. And there's other people that can have an agreement of heart about something, that is to say they, they have the same will regarding a course of action, but the course of action is wrong. So what's absolutely crucial is not the being of one accord. It's not the being of one mind. It's not the being of one heart. It's the being of one mind that is in agreement upon the truth. It is an agreement of the heart that is based upon the truth. So that is, without question, of great importance uh, in, in our agreement that, that, that it's important, that it's true, 
and, and that is that it's only certain to be true. It is only certain to be true when it is truth that is found in God's Word. Some people will say, well, you know, I believe in the truth of the science. Really? You believe in tr the truth of science? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I used to be an engineer. But I have seven books in my library that were written by scientists. And the books that were written by scientists, each one of them is an expose of fraudulent science. Is an expose of errors and untruths that scientists claim sometimes for long periods of time to be absolutely true. Oh, we just made a discovery and that's not really true. And if you know anything about the history of science, then you know that a person who claims that they base everything on science, uh, that's a very shaky foundation because science is always changing their opinions about this. Am I right, Mr. Chemist? Am I right? Yeah, that's you. You're supposed to say yes out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. In the second psalm, we see the effect of individuals who have reached a consensus of heart, even if a direct mention of their oneness of heart is not specifically made in that verse, uh, the context shows it to be true. If the mind is that faculty where the imagination operates, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and then Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, suggests the operation of the thoughts of the mind, and verses 2 and 3 of that same psalm likely reflect, reflect the agreement of wills among men, their unity of heart. Let me read that to you. David writes, I think he was the psalmist who wrote this, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together to take counsel together regarding decisions that you're going to make. In decision, the, 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 the seat of your will is the heart. This is describing the heart, if not naming the heart. They take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. If individuals can be of one collective mind, homothumadon, or not, then it seems reasonable to suggest that individuals can also be a one collective heart, or not. In our previous venture into matters of the heart, we scrutinized 59 different instances in which reference was made in God's word to their heart, such as when their heart melted or their heart failed. Those kinds of passages strongly suggest that individuals are operating with unanimity of heart so that they are effectively exercising a single seat of collective will and decision making even as they are numerous individuals they are operating in concert we consider those verses this evening in our English Bible containing the phrase their hearts plural Suggesting that although groups are frequently in mind, they are arriving at decisions in the seats of their wills as individuals and not as a cohesive and united group. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 36, And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts. Plural. In the lands of their enemies. Leviticus chapter 26 lists God's warnings and predicted punishment of the children of Israel for not complying with the demands of the law of Moses. Many will die in their sinful rebellion against God, along with God sending faintness into their hearts in their dispersion. Other terrible things will also befall them. Faintness has to do with fearfulness. It has to do with timidity. But I want you to notice that God will send a faintness into their hearts, that is, each individual will be frightened and lacking courage by himself as a result of God's judgment. Joshua chapter 11 verse 20, For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should, uh, that they should come against Israel in battle. This speaks of God's decision to grant Israel's enemies the determination to continue their opposition to Joshua on the field of battle but so that they would be utterly destroyed. 
Though each of those men who fought against the children of Israel was hardened in his own heart, each man was alone responsible to God and was given his own hardened heart by God. In other words, God dealt with each man of them in this regard, even though they were a group and acted in concert, he judged them as individuals, held them responsible as individuals, making their own individual decisions. Sometimes people, when they act in concert with other people, that they run with the crowd, um, and they are, uh, what, what was the term that I used uh, last time? Um, Come on, help me now. Huh? Mob mentality. Yeah, mob mentality. It may not be a technically accurate description, but it does reflect reality. Sometimes young men, when they reflect mob mentality, think that they are alleviating their personal responsibility because they're spreading their responsibility around. Well, well, it wasn't just me, it was them too. It wasn't just her, it was them too. Uh, but you have to understand when it comes to the decisions that you make, regardless of whether it's done in concert with other people or not, you and I are solely responsible to God for the decisions that we make. Judges chapter 9 verse 3, And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. Abimelech's brothers were unanimous in their decision to follow him, though there is no indication that any of them surrendered his will to the majority to go along with them as the group. This was each man casting his own vote to follow the lead of his brother, Abimelech. Bad choice. Judges chapter 16, verse 25, And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. Of course, these are the idolatrous Philistines, celebrating and making sport of the blinded and shackled Samson, not realizing that by now his hair has begun to grow back, and his supernatural strength has returned. Each man present was merry in his own heart, without any consideration of others <clears throat> present, and it did not end well for them, did it? Oh, but we're happy. Just because you're happy doesn't mean it's going to end well. Judges 19, verse 22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, and it continues on. A son of Belial is actually an ungovernable man. That's a guy that nobody tells him what to do. He does whatever he wants to do. He doesn't care about the rules. He doesn't care about the law. He doesn't care about, about, the, about the wisdom of those, of, of those elders. The last phrase of the verse suggests that they were homosexuals, as were those in Sodom who expressed the same sentiment toward the angels who visited Lot in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 5. They are a group of individuals who are making merry, each man in his heart, who will face the consequences of their individual choices. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6. Wherefore do, you, do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among them? This is the conversation among Philistines who are suffering from tumors of some kind, though at the time of the King James Bible translation, um, these tumors were thought to have been terrible hemorrhoids. That's the reason the word is translated emeralds, which was the 1611 word for hemorrhoids. Uh, as God's punishment to them for having taken the Ark of the Covenant in battle. Actually, it's probable that these are just various kinds of tumors that had erupted on various parts of their body. Um, they are discussing here how they might obtain relief from their agonizing pain. They're rebuking each other for behaving as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did when Moses sought the release of the children of Israel, each among them hardening his own heart. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 14, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven, nor in the earth, which thou keepest, uh, which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. This is Solomon's acknowledgement that God blesses individuals 
who walk before him with all their hearts. This speaks of God blessing each individual for his own heart's obedience and compliance to God's will. Now, because it's a Wednesday night, I don't have time to go through all of these passages. Just know that uh, in a day or so, this entire message will be up on the church website, and every single passage that I uh, could have referred to and would have referred to had I no mercy on you will be up there, um, going all the way through Psalms and and uh, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and and uh, and Zechariah and um, um, let's see where else do I want to go? Mm -hmm. We read in in the book of Daniel that that uh, Daniel chapter five that Nebuchadnezzar's mind hardened in pride. And as that happened to him, so a man can, can make his heart, his heart hard like stone uh, to prevent hearing the law with effect. In other words, you, you can, you can uh, harden your mind and it affects your heart. You can be lifted up with pride and it interferes with the reception of truth. And, and we know this from our own experience that when we get all uh, stove up with stubbornness, that we are not receptive to anything. I've made up my mind, don't, don't trouble me with facts, uh, don't try to correct me, I've determined that I'm going to do it, whether it's right or wrong, and, and that's just the way it is. So to, to so harden your heart for the purpose of making it impervious to the influence of God's Word, to, to affect the will, it will result in a very real consequence in people's lives. Whereas the Lord of hosts had sent his spirit by the prophets of old, the result will be great wrath from the Lord of hosts. God will not allow a man or a woman who decides ahead of time that he or she will not allow his will to be changed by God's word. In other words, a person says, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm not going to do that. Um, God's not going to let anyone get away with that. Yeah. Okay? Um, such a foolhardy decision brings great wrath upon man. In the New Testament, just a couple of verses, Mark chapter 2, verse 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, though they were in a group, Mark's gospel reveals their individual deliberations in the seat of the will which is in each person's heart. Luke chapter 1, verse 66, And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. The word, um, the word laid translates the Greek verb tithemi, which means to place. So, so what we have here is, is like Psalm 119, verse 11, referring to hiding God's word, word in your heart. Here in the parable of the, and, and in the parable of the soils, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of the Word of God being sown in your heart. Here we see people who placed what they had seen and heard surrounding the loosing of Zacharias' tongue. You remember he was, he, was, he was mute during the period of his wife's pregnancy before she gave birth to John the Baptist um, and the naming of John the Baptist in their hearts. And this is an individual manner in which God dealt with him as an individual and deals with others as individuals. We could go on in Luke. We could go on in, uh, in the book of Acts. Let me read one verse in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 7.39, To whom our fathers would not obey, that thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Now this comes from the mouth of the martyr Stephen. His account of the children of Israel refusing to obey Moses and, and turning in their hearts toward Egypt. As repentance is a turning away from sin, this speaks of those individuals turning the wrong way. Turning toward Egypt with their hearts. People in our day do the same thing Stephen was referring to when they, when they turn from God and his word to dwell on and receive into their heart to receive into their thinking and their thinking processes, their decision-making processes, influences whose sources are not scriptural. If you're going to allow anything or anyone to affect your decision-making processes, you need to 